Alrighty, hello everyone and welcome to Handmade Heroes, where we code a complete game live on stream. Uh, today I want to take a look, we started playing around with room layout uh, last weekend, and I would like to uh, try to do a couple things to that code now that we're just informed by us playing around with it. Uh, specifically, I feel like just from playing around with it a little bit, the sense that I got in trying to make a fairly simple routine um, was that it was too cumbersome to talk about the layout of rooms in ways that was uh, error free, right? And so there was a lot of like problems with thinking about how to do things without having off by one errors when you're doing like sort of tile based layouts and things like this. And so I think what I gained from doing that playing around with it last weekend was that I would like to maybe make something uh, make some code that manually lays out some rooms in a known pattern uh, and figure out what how to make the uh, sort of the API, the, the, the way in which we talk about where rooms are and how they're placed. I'd like to get that right uh, before I try to write anything more complicated like the code we were playing with. So, because like I said, when you start playing around with something like this and you're opening up a new section of the code, a section that is brand new where we haven't really done anything uh, with anything like it previously, uh, it's important to kind of feel it out and go, how, how is coding here going to go? And what do I need to be effective here? Like what, what am I, what, how can I do it so that I'm not spinning my wheels and wasting my time? What do I need? Right? Uh, and so what I would like to do here is I would like to start pushing that forward, right? I'd like to figure out uh, how I can uh, sort of get a good, I guess the word I'm looking for is a good semantics in place for talking about where rooms can go, where they did go, uh, and how I want them placed. And I don't think what I picked at first was good. I think it was bad. Uh, and I'll explain why in a second. So if you remember, uh, we sort of had this um, this concept in here of a of a volume where a room could be placed, uh, and this was just some integers that said the min and the max, right? It's a pretty uh, straightforward idea, uh, and I don't think there's anything I, I obviously wrong with this, right? I don't think there's some kind of, uh, of, of horrible uh, design decision here, but I do think there was a problem with the interpretation of it. Uh, and you remember, I actually said, I'm not sure if this is the right way when I did it. And I think when I did it, uh, when I actually went to use it, I think that confirmed that it was in fact not the right way. And I like to do it a little bit differently. Specifically, uh, what I chose to do was say that the min and the max uh, were actually exclusive, uh, the, or sorry, the min was inclusive and the max was exclusive. So this is a fairly standard interval uh, technique. It's basically saying that, and it's, it tends, it's like how triangle fill and stuff like that tends to work, those kinds of fill rules. Uh, and the reason for it is if you have a, uh, an understanding of how something is laid out and you put two rectangles next to each other such that one's min is the other one's max, you don't want them both to fill uh, the same column. And so let me draw this out for you. We've talked about this a little bit when we talked about fill rules. Um, and I just want to kind of cement the reason why uh, these sorts of things exist and then talk about the problem that I had with it uh, that prevented it from being good. So specifically, the problem is as follows. We are on a tile map grid. Uh, and so when we talk about the tile map grid, what we end up talking about, or what we were talking about anyway, and maybe we don't want to still talk about it this way, which is why I'm bringing it up, uh, but what we were talking about uh, is imagining that we have a set of integers mapped to effectively the tiles, okay? So what that means is that if I was to say take integer three, uh, that is this column. Let's say uh, an integer seven is this row or something like this. So it would be eight, 
9, 10, 11, whatever. So this is just some random section of the grid. And so what I now have to do is say, well, I want to talk about a room. And a room is a collection of these tiles that happens to be rectangular at the moment, right? Now, we don't really care if it's rectangular at the end of the day, but we'll probably build it up out of rectangles even if it's not rectangular. So we do want a convenient way of talking about more than one tile, because talking about each individual tile that comprises a room, especially when most of these rooms are going to be rectangular because the screen's rectangular and we want to fill it with a room, uh, it's just very cumbersome and unnecessary, right? It would not be a smart way to do it to pass like a list of all of the tiles because there'd be like, you know, a hundred tiles in this room and we'd be passing a list of a hundred integer uh, pairs instead of just passing two integer pairs, the min and the max, right? So you can see why this makes some sense, why we want to do rectangle-based referencing of regions for all kinds of purposes. Uh, and so what we're going to end up here with some way of saying, look, let's suppose that this is the region I'm talking about. Now we all know what that region is. I colored it in. It's the region that includes, you know, 4, 8, 4, uh, I'm sorry, 4, 9, 5, 8, 5, 9, uh, six, eight, six, nine. That's the region we're talking about. So there's no ambiguity in what I'm trying to say, right? But there's plenty of ambiguity in how I want to encode that. So one way of encoding that is by using intervals, right? A min and a max by saying, this is the range that I'm going to do. And there's a very, uh, there's a lot of different ways that I could imagine talking about these things. For example, I could encode this as four through six, uh, comma, eight through nine, right? And this is effectively a interval that says everything, including the number specified, is included in the region. Right? So when I say four, I mean everything to the right of four and four. And when I say six, I mean everything to the left of six and six. In mathematics, uh, shorthand notation, oftentimes they will use uh, brackets or parentheses uh, to indicate which of these they mean. So oftentimes in mathematics literature, you will see something uh, to represent this as brackets for comma six. And that means I want the interval four through six, including four and including six. On the other hand, if I wanted to instead represent this as three through seven, seven through 10, that suggests the boundary, right? So now I am telling you the numbers that bound the region, but which do not themselves include in that region. So I don't include three or seven. They are not actually in the interval. They are on the just, just outside. They're one past it, right? And in mathematics, you would often write that, and again, I want to put a little caveat on this because I don't quite mean you would often write that, but parentheses are usually used to talk about uh, excluding that one d digit that's actually on the end. So you might say three comma seven, not brackets three seven, which would have, oops, which would have included three through seven. Now, the reason I say not quite is because this presumes that we're talking about discrete things only, not that kind of discrete but that kind of discrete. When you write this kind of an interval in mathematics more generally, you're actually just talking about literally the position on the number line that is three. Is it included or not? But two, I'm sorry, 3.0000000000001, for example, would still be included. So in our case, we're talking about the first thing that would be included if three is not included is four. In real math, not real as in actual math or not fake math, but real as in real numbers, um, when you write intervals, you're talking about the infinity of numbers, not just the discrete ones. But if we're only talking about the discrete ones, uh, then again, maybe that makes more sense. Either way, 
doesn't matter to us. We're never going to use this notation. Uh, I just wanted to point out that you've seen this before if you've taken uh, high school math classes, um, I would think at least, would have had a part where they mentioned something like this or had a little bit of something like this. Uh, so again, the concept that you need to talk about whether or not the bounding value is in or out is not specific to tile maps. It's not specific to fill rules. It's not specific to computing. It's actually something that even mathematicians have to deal with uh, all the way back to the time when computers were not even a thing that anyone thought about. Uh, they still had to think about whether or not when they talked about um, a, a particular number as the bounds of a region, did they mean greater than or greater than or equal to, right? Because that's what we're really talking about here, right? In this case, we're talking about greater than. In this case, we're talking about greater than or equal to, right? Uh, and so that's a very common thing. It's not unique to us. Uh, it's, it's common in math in general. But uh, again, just wanted to put that as a side. It doesn't matter that it's common to math because whether or not it is common to math or not, we still have to deal with it here. So what we do know is it's common to us. Um, and so what I want to talk about here is how we're actually storing this and the consequences uh, that we end up having when we, uh, when we work with these things. Okay. So, um, the problems that, uh, that I want to make sure that we handle properly and the things that I want to look at more carefully. And maybe we're doing fine, but I just want to look at them and pull them out into reliable things that we can count on so I don't have to think about it anymore, uh, is we have to pick some rule for how these things are talked about. And not only do we have these two options, meaning include or exclude the two bounds, uh, we have the option of doing it heterogeneously, heterogeneously such as include the three, uh, well, in this case, it would be include the four, don't include the seven, right? Similarly, don't include the three, do include the six, right? So we actually have, in this case, uh, four viable options here for how we might want to include this, uh, include, encode this. Um, one is exclusive of both, one is inclusive of both, one is exclusive on one, inclusive on the other, and the other one is the opposite, right? And again, that just corresponds to all the possibilities there are. There's two possibilities, right? Uh, include, exclude. And so, and we have two things we can include or exclude, so it's two times two equals four possibilities, right? So the one I chose was actually this one. Uh, and that is the, the convention that's often used for fill rules generally, uh, which is that the min is included and the max is not included. Now, why would you want to do that? The reason that you'd want to do that is because it allows you to set the min and the max to the same value um, and not overlap. So if, for example, I know that I want two rooms to line up, I set their min to one value and their max to the same value, and I know that they're touching, right? Um, so that's what I did. I'm just not sure that's the way that makes it the easiest to talk about. And so what I'd like to do today is I'd like to go in and start to look at what were the sorts of things we were trying to do just in that one simple routine that was like looking at how it would have to bound a room in order to touch all the things it was supposed to, uh, to, to like abut uh, all of the rooms it was supposed to abut. Uh, wasn't a very complicated routine, but it was kind of complicated to get right just because of all the like off by one confusingness of it, right? And so I would like to figure out uh, how to sort of talk about those things a little bit more conveniently uh, in a way that's semantically easy to remember so that we don't have to worry as much about that as we're programming. Like I don't, because it's going to be too slow. We're going to get bogged down if we're constantly having to like think through and debug these sort of tweaky, like, does this thing actually line up where we think it does kinds of stuff. So I just want to look at that uh, and, and see if that is doing what it should be doing. Um, and that's what we really want to look at, right? So here is the code in question. And uh, what you can see is we have some uh, pretty uh, straightforward kinds of stuff for the connection. Just like, hey, could I go in this direction or couldn't I? 
That seems reasonable. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, and then I start to look at, well, which side was I going to do? Am I doing the min side or the max side of this thing? Which, you know, my, which way am I trying to go out? Uh, and what we find here is we find that we call like clip min or clip max. Uh, and we say stuff like, well, okay, I need to clip the minimum to whatever the maximum was. And I need to clip the maximum to whatever the maximum was like plus one, right? Um, And it's just like, I guess that that's not that big of a deal. Uh, that's just saying, hey, there has to be some volume to the room. So really, you know, I could have done it that way, which seems still symmetric, so that's pretty reasonable. Then when I'm going to clip the minimum, I'm clipping that to the, um, uh, the minimum of the maximum, I should say, to the other volume. That's that's all right. So these actually don't look as bad as I as I as I thought they might be and we can make those a little more standard let's take a look at these guys here so you can see there's a bit of a of an asymmetry here though that I don't necessarily love right um, this part is not great we would like these to look symmetric I think like we really I just don't think fundamentally want to have um, these kinds of lines look asymmetric. If I want to shrink the thing in by the interior apron, uh, I think you would want it to look symmetric. Now, the reason it doesn't look symmetric at the moment um, is because if we're going to clip the maximum to something, in order to overlap by one, I've got to make sure that I add one to it because it's not going to include where it is. Uh, whereas on the other hand, on the min side, I don't have to do that, right? Now let's make sure that's actually correct. Uh, but I'm pretty sure it is. Uh, let, if I go ahead and run this, by the way. It should just produce a bunch of connected rooms. Uh, I don't know why that didn't load my project. There we go. Must have like closed the project last time or something. Um, so these rooms are lined up the way that I think that they should be, right? Um, let me go ahead and undo this. And I should verify that they are not. Yeah. So that's kind of an example of an asymmetry that I don't love. And you know, again, I say what I'm looking for here is I want ways to talk about these things that don't accumulate off by ones. Because if you accumulate off by ones, then the programmer always has to be thinking about whether there's an off by one in there. And if there is, they have to manually correct for it. And that's what I did here. Uh, but that's not really good. And so for me, I think looking at this, if I was to say that the maximum included where it was, um, then I think this maybe becomes more symmetric, I think. So let's suppose that the max did include where it was. What would this look like? Well, if the max included where it was, uh, then the minimum volumes so so um, let me talk about one of the things going on here that's not obvious. One of the things that's a little bit of an issue is that when we talk about mins and maxes, we're actually we have a two layers of that going on right now. Not only do we have the min and max of the region we're talking about, but this is actually talking about a min and a max of those min and maxes, right? Because we're talking about a region where we can place the min 
and a region where we can place the max. So we have a volume for minimums and a volume for maximums. And so I think that's also what's causing the triple here. Because for example, let's suppose I wanted to have the max include its own line. Well, at that point, we still sort of have a problem the reason for that is that when we're clipping the minimum volumes, maximum location, it can be, uh, we need to make sure that that doesn't ever go below a legal limit. So if I were to switch that, I think I would just have to, I, I'd have to end up basically doing that, right? Um, it would move where the plus one was in this case. The max um, of the minimum, so the furthest the minimum can be in terms of where the other room, compared to where the other room's maximum is, uh, yeah, obviously that can't be any less than uh, the maximum of that room, right? It has to all be to the other side of it. So both the min and the max have to be to the other side of the maximum. So no, I guess I'm, I guess I'm not, I'm mistaken. Since everything's inclusive and the min and the max could be at the same value, it really looks more like this. Right? Uh, so if the min and the max are actually included bounds, I think that regularizes the handling a little bit. It basically says, look, the minimum has to move to this line. The maximum has to move to this other line, right? Um, and I think that's just it. So I'm going to go ahead and experiment with that a little bit. But that seems better to me, just looking at this routine and looking at what will happen if I change the definition of what happens there. It starts to get rid of some of those like, okay, this one has to have a plus one, this one has to, like, now it's like everyone gets the same modifier. And that's what I'm looking for. I want a way to uniformly think about that. And it seems like that's just better. Uh, again, there's obvious reasons not to use that sort of a rule in other contexts. In this context, it's just really looking to me uh, like I want to do it that way. So I'm going to try doing it that way, and then we'll see what happens uh, as we go forwards. So uh, when we have like the infinity volume and the inverted infinity volume, those are both um, not going to change because we don't care whether the like those are initial like giant things or uh, completely impossible things, and that they don't really change uh, one way or the other. So that part is not uh, relevant. Um, so the only parts we really care about are these things here where we've got sort of like min dimensions for rooms and that sort of stuff. So when we subtract these here, uh, we need to take a look at what the results will be. In this case, if we have a max and a min that are the same, they'll subtract to one. Uh, if there's, yeah, so, so really what we want here is, is I think the same thing that we have. Uh, it, I think, to be honest, sorry, uh, if we have them the same, they'll subtract to zero. Uh, so we need to sort of say that the dimension of the room is, is one more than whatever we would have computed, right? So I think what I'd like to do here is just, uh, you know, have some sort of a, <clears throat> just 
so I can talk about them either way. Um, and we could actually make these uh, be points as well if we wanted to. I don't know that we really care about that uh, one way or the other, but, but we could, right? We could call this a struct of um, of gen points. Maybe I will. We'll do that in a second. So if we want to have a thing here which basically says like, you know, and maybe this is more like a gen B3. Uh, if I want to be able to say get dim on one of these gen volumes, uh, this allows me to say, uh, give me the, uh, the computation we would have done here. And I just want to make this expand by one. So that allows me to get uh, this sort of understanding of the dimensions of the thing that's got our assumptions about the fill rule baked into it so that other people don't have to constantly think about what that fill rule is. Uh, the fill rule will just automatically sort of be taken into account when you look at the, um, that fill. So then here, uh, this routine, Uh, can now use that and the same check will now work because the fill rule has been baked into here so you do get back the number of tiles that are included so that seems fine uh, the maximum volume stuff will still work because we just use the mins and the maxes that there are so that doesn't really affect get affected by the fill rule because the fill rule was consistent on both uh, the inner and outer volumes, so it just carries through. Um, and the rest of this stuff pretty much just works exactly how you would expect. Creating the union and the intersection, again, still the same, although for the intersection, um, I have to think about whether there's any special considerations. I don't think there are. Um, I think it's still fine. <clears throat> All right, so let's keep on going here. Uh, so now when we get to uh, this part, for example, uh, the min and the maxes uh, don't overlap anymore. Uh, this is particularly important because in the previous version, the min and the max did. So when we say door at, uh, we're actually going to get one of the values is the one we actually want. And you can see here when we're getting it, uh, we, we get the min of the door. We get the, the min line. So wherever the door um, at is, we can just use that column as the max and the min is just the column before it. So this is now uh, the correct way to place the door uh, in there. Now we could do this another way, which is to do uh, use one's min and one's max, uh, which I suppose is kind of a more interesting way to do it potentially, uh, which would be to do something like this. Well, you know what? I don't really care. We'll just call it that still. So that's fine. And I don't mind about the asymmetry here because this is the kind of asymmetry I actually coded myself, right? I basically said, look, I'm gonna start on the min and I know that like one back from me is the max. So this is all the right thought process. This to me is not a concern. These up here were because the thought process was the same on either side, but I was getting two different equations. That's the thing that flagged it for me as like, I should look at this more carefully. Uh, this is not one of those, that is totally fine. All right, so I think all of this is probably fine, although we may have to look at it again. Um, yeah, so, so there is one aspect of it, which is that this part here, uh, it's, I think this is a greater than, right? Um, 
because you include the max right I'll have to think about how I want these to work I think these technically also are a little bit off right I think it's this because the maximum allowed dimensions um, for a room are if you were to add that to a min, you would get one more than what you actually wanted, right? Now, maybe you could argue what we really want to do here is just talk about dimensions in a different way. Like we could talk about a room, like if we chose, we could say that the dimension of a room is one tiles worth is zero, that's a z size zero room. Two tiles is a size one room, right? And if you did that, you wouldn't need to put any of these in there. Because then the max allowed dim would just already have the negative one in it. So the max allowed dim for a 16 tile room would be a 15, right? I don't know that I want to cross that bridge. Uh... I, it may be that that would actually be the right thing to do and the code would be simpler everywhere. I just don't know if it's the right thing to do. I, I, I just want to point it out because you can see it, right? You see it, hopefully, what I'm talking about. Um, but I don't know if that's what you would want. I uh, think that's sort of one of those things that remains to be seen. Um, Yeah. All right. Uh, so let's move on. I just want to get this old code working, um, and uh, with with the new sort of uh, rule. Now. When we go to room gen, uh, we can actually sort of just quickly fix that the uh, part of this code that actually re requires the room vol uh, is minimal. You can see it really only happens at the top here. Uh, so when we actually go to generate the room, we can obey the new fill rule pretty trivially. Uh, when we look at the X count and we subtract these two things here, uh, all we really have to do is that, right? Um, now, if we want to make it a little simpler on ourselves, we don't really even have to do that. Uh, what we can do instead here is talk about uh, one of these Gen V3s, right? Uh, and just say, all right, look, get me the dim of the room volume. We know that that will automatically compute all of these for us and it'll compute it with the fill rule so we don't have to know if the fill rule changed, we would just work, uh, which is kind of nice as well. So we can just do that. And then this thing, Keeps on going just fine. This is a stand-in room, uh, stand-in generator anyway. This is code we don't care about, uh, so we don't really have to worry about this part too much. But we will be looking at this code later on and seeing uh, what we think of it. <clears throat> All right. Uh, so is in volume also has to be changed here. And now that we're sort of getting these uh, vol these gen volume things, that we could probably pull those out into a separate file that uh, has what we want in it, so we could see all of the gen volume stuff and. Uh, in kind of nicely compacted uh, form. So let's see here. All right, so we're not quite there yet um, as far as placing rooms is concerned, uh, but that's basically what we need to do. So let me go ahead and pull this out. I would like a handmade um, gen volume uh, or I don't know if gen V3, gen math, I don't know. <clears throat> Uh, and again, these are like just special purpose routines that, that happen to work uh, however we want them to for just this particular case. Uh, so they're, you know, they're not real math routines, they're special kinds of math routines. Um, 
so let me just go ahead and take a look at everywhere that we're using these sorts of things. There we go. Here's some of our initializers. And again, all I'm really doing here is just pulling these out uh, so that you can see them in one place uh, <clears throat> relatively easily. I think there was a little bit more down here. Uh, so now we can kind of go through and make sure that that stuff works, uh, just debug it, and then start to use it, which I think uh, hopefully it's a little bit better than what I had before in terms of just the reliability of being able to think it through, uh, I, I hope, will increase. And who knows, maybe it won't. Uh, maybe that was a waste of time. Cannot open include file. Handmade gen math. Really? Oh, whoops, they got put in the wrong place. My bad. So these two actually want to be in code. Uh, not sure what happened there. No big deal though. All right. So now I think uh, we can go ahead and, <laughs> no, what? what was that? What was that? Why, what, what was that? Does someone want to tell me what that was? Why did Visual Studio decide to take a few seconds to do whatever it was going to do? It doesn't always. All right. Uh, so now I think we can go ahead and step through uh, or take a look more closely. Perhaps I should first um, just actually make sure this stuff uh, makes sense at, at face value. But then we can go and step through and see uh, how to make sure that we, we get this stuff right. Um, <clears throat> so as for is in volume, like I said, I think that's right now because we're saying the min and the max are both included. Uh, for our infinity volumes and inverted infinity volumes, uh, those are again both what you'd expect. They're just setting large uh, inclusive or, or, or opposite bounds, one or the other. Uh, for getting uh, things like testing minimum dimensions of the room, we just need to get uh, the dimensions of the room, uh, which we do here, and I think we do correctly here, which is one more than whatever the difference is. Uh, we then just say, look, if uh, we're greater than 441, then we're good to go. Uh, for get maximum volume for, again, still just taking the min and the max of the two inputs, that's the same. Uh, for clipping, we just always clip to the actual value that we're given, which is exactly what we think should happen. Uh, the union and the intersect are not changed. Uh, they should just be the same. And so all of that looks fine. So we must have something in the actual usage code, or I just like skipped over something there accidentally. Uh, but we should have something in the usage code that I busted <clears throat> and didn't update uh, because that all looks fine. All right. Uh, and that actually makes sense because I guess uh, we got to go double check that we're clipping properly to the, we're clipping to the things we actually want to clip to. Uh, so yeah, the minimum has to be clipped to the max plus one. That makes sense. The max has to be clipped uh, to the max. I feel like this is also, I feel like doesn't everything just have to be clipped to here? Maybe I'm wrong about that, but I, uh, this, this shouldn't really affect anything I don't think, but I believe <clears throat> when we're clipping, basically what we want to say is uh, 
the min and the max of the minimum can now not go past that bound. And of course, the maximum also can't go past it on the minimum side. Um, it's basically saying, hey, look, I need to set the, the minimum needs to lie on this line. Right. But the uh, the maximum just can't go past it. And the same is true here. Uh, <clears throat> It's basically just saying uh, the maximum value of the minimum now can't go past this line and the min and the max of the, of the max vol are set to that line so it has to be there. So that seems right to me. Um, that doesn't seem at all uh, odd or unusual. Here where we're clipping the min and the max uh, to the interior apron, that seems fine. So that all seems good. So I would say it's probably this code down here that's a little bit worked um, because all that looks fine to me. Uh, in here we've got the dimensions we're iterating through. The min and the max just are what the min and max are. Um, <clears throat> we take a look at whether we exceed uh, the maximum allowed dimensions for that particular uh, dimension in question. Assuming that we do exceed the maximum dimension in question, uh, we want to just set the max equal to wherever the minimum is plus whatever the allowed dimension is uh, minus one. <clears throat> that seems fine. I don't see a problem with that. So then we say, okay, if the max, uh, as a result of setting it that way, would have exceeded wherever um, its minimum location could have been, uh, we need to move it to that minimum location, uh, and then we need to set the minimum to be whatever the maximum is minus the So we're setting it off of the other direction now. Again, that seems fine. Then we look to see, okay, if the min volume uh, is greater than whatever its maximum was allowed to be, then we can't actually fill it. And then we go ahead and do a place room. So yeah, I don't know. I don't see a lot of, of error there, but then again, you never do, do you? Uh, place room and volume. I'm gonna see if we ever get there, just so I know who's at fault here. Um, so it looks like that routine at least thinks it succeeds. Not only, let's see what the volume it actually gives us. Uh, negative four to four, negative four to four, min z to max z. So it actually created a room that's two, two things high, uh, which was not really my intention. Um, now that I think about it, that's because this is the initial room. Let's try in here. What kind of volume we get here? Negative 20, negative eight, zero uh, to negative five, zero, zero. Again, a perfectly legal room. So it looks like that code is actually working properly. Let me just fix one uh, slight problem here, which is the initial room placement uh, actually should look uh, more, you know, like, uh, let's say that. Because it'd be negative four, negative three, negative two, negative one are the first four. Zero, one, two, three are the next four. Uh, and that's what it should be set to. So assuming we look at that, oops. Uh, what we should see now is we should be able to see uh, in the, the actual thing that generates the room data, right? Uh, I don't know where that went off to. It's this code, but it just didn't end up on the tabs there. Um, so in this code, we should be able to see now why we're not actually placing a room here. So what's our dimensions? Uh, it's 881, that seems very reasonable. Um, X count, Y count, Z count, negative four, negative four, zero. Uh, it seems like that should be producing 
a, uh, a valid, you know, region. So I'm not sure why we weren't seeing anything. Hmm. I guess I must have done something weird there. Maybe the, that in, initial height of two created some kind of a confusion. I don't know why we have two. Oh, maybe that's why Visual Studio took because I had another Visual Studio running. Maybe if you try to run a Visual Studio on top of another Visual Studio, it takes longer to load or something. I don't know. I don't know why it would. Uh, so yeah, just looking at um, uh, just looking at what that did, that seems pretty pretty uh, straightforward. Now we're not quite there yet because we should have placed. Well, I guess I don't know. We may only be placing two rooms right now. I'm not sure. Uh, but uh, but either way, that seems a little bit more sane to me. I'm, I'm much more okay with that uh, than I was with the other way around. So let's try to... <clears throat> let's try to make something with, with this understanding of what a volume is let's try to make some code that like lays out a particular organization for uh, what we want, right? <clears throat> so how hard is it to manually code a particular layout? So let's say we've got uh, the orphanage here. Uh, and we know exactly how we want it. It's just, it's a fixed layout, right? We're not gonna let the generation code do anything. When it sees Orphan, it just gotta lay out exactly this thing, right? Uh, so how would we go about like coding something that look, put, did a particular layout? So let's, let's actually make uh, how I want that to happen. So let's say there's like, um, um, let's say there's a hallway here uh, and I want to have uh, bedrooms off of it. Something like that. Uh, and maybe there's a hallway here. Maybe this is the same room. Probably not. Say so these are both hallways. Um, so you got rooms off the hallway, and then maybe you've got uh, the kitchen. I don't really know. I don't study orphanages. I don't know how they would be laid out. This is the main room. Uh, and then maybe there's the back door area. Like maybe this is actually the side alley. Uh, and this is the forest path and the forest entrance. Uh, and this is the garden. Although it makes more sense for the garden to be in the back, wouldn't it? Maybe. Did I get everything? I guess technically there was a tailoring room here. I don't know. That seems reasonable. All right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do two different steps. The first step is I'm going to make something that basically looks like this horrible diagram here and tries to lay out exactly this. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to try to make something that uses uh, is effectively a, uh, an unlock table to make the orphanage expand based on what the player has, you know, unlocked, right? Uh, and we don't actually care about unlocking at this point. It's not relevant to us. What we care about is whether it makes it easy for the code, again, to talk about stuff like, does this room exist or doesn't it exist? Does this hallway need to be here or not? That sort of stuff. Uh, and again, the reason I'm doing this is because I want to get, I, I want to convince myself I'm remaining skeptical. I want to convince myself 
that talking about inclusive on their bounds volumes, uh, I want to convince myself that that's the most error-free or the least error-prone way of discussing what tiles a room encloses. Because I'm still not sure that's what I want. I just suspect that it's what I want. Uh, and until I actually see more evidence though, I don't want to commit to it. So we're just going to do those two steps. Again, they're fairly straightforward, but they're going to require me to do a bunch of thinking about how to specify room bounds. And that's exactly what I want to be doing because I want to see how many mistakes I make and if those mistakes are related to that part of the code that I'm talking about, right? That should give me a litmus test uh, as to whether or not this is a sane way of describing what I'm describing. Uh, okay, so what I'm gonna do here is I'm going to start to talk about uh, these rooms a little bit differently. I'm gonna do the same thing that I did before where I just generate all the rooms uh, in question and uh, I don't know if the back door path, I think what we're really talking about here is there's like two hallways. Those hallways uh, at the moment are not represented. So we need those two. Uh, we need the like front hall and the back hall. Uh, and these are actually going to be more up in here with, uh, I guess we'll have basic hall spec kind of thing. These are hallways. I don't know if that's, or maybe I should call it hallway spec. <clears throat> so these are just going to be, uh, and again, we're not caring about the spec stuff yet. That's just a placeholder to sort of say, hey, look, somehow we're going to have to talk about what's in a hallway in addition to the fact that it is a hallway. Uh, and so that'll be where that stuff starts getting expanded on when we're ready, uh, but not yet. So once I have these rooms, now I want to be able to place these rooms in, in, some, uh, in some way that makes um, sense. <clears throat> And so what I want to do is say, all right, let's put on hold this notion of connections that are non-specific, and let's start talking about connections that are specific. <clears throat> I want to tell you where I expect these things uh, to be placed, and then from then, from there on, we can uh, uh, get a little bit more fancy, right? <clears throat> Uh, so looking at the di diagram here, what I want to do is start to talk about um, how connections can be placed around uh, around a room, I guess would be the way to say it. Uh, and so I need some way of articulating that. And I don't know what the right way to do it would be, but I suspect that it might be something like this. Uh, so a connection is a side plus an ordinal. And then what I will do is say that as I say what side you're connected on, um, I can effectively give you an ordinal that says where you are. So the zeroth connection is here, the first is here, the second is here, the third is here. Right? Um, and that'll give me a way of just placing things along the sides of rooms, uh, and then I can just iterate over them and put them there, right? Uh, and so in here, I can just say, look, when we're doing this connection, let's say now there's an extended version of the connection call, which actually specifies what side uh, we're on. I believe we have a, what, what was it called, uh, box. Uh, I believe we have surface indices that can help us here. We can use this to talk about what side of the thing you're on in a consistent way that we already built like a bunch of information about. Uh, so what I should be able to say here is I want this connection to go in this specific location. Um, 
<clears throat> and let's let's do that. So going from the main room to the bedroom, that's not what that is anymore. Uh, let's say that this is, let me, let me actually lay these out specifically on the diagram so we know what we're talking about here. A, B, C, and D, as well as hero. Uh, so let's just say that's like, um, here's the hero's bedroom. Here's A, B, C, uh, and D. Looks like there might be an E here. Um, cross that bridge when we come to it. Uh, also, maybe the maybe we want this to be. You know what? Let's 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 make a slight change. Let's make this a little bit more sane. Um, let me redraw this. So, if this is the main room, let's say that we've got um, kitchen uh, and the tailor here. Let's say that the hallway runs like this. Um, right, so we got the A, B, C, D bedrooms here. Uh, and then let's say that the hero bedroom is like right here. Uh, and I feel like I kind of want this because I want these other um, uh, bedrooms here to kind of be available. Uh, the reason is like if we wanted to have some save slots, I was thinking that maybe the save slots slots just map to a bedroom. Uh, so basically like, you know, this is slot A, slot B, and slot C for save games. Uh, and so maybe the way that you start your game is you pick which one of these you want to start in and then you hop out into the hall and go, right? Um, maybe that's how you save your game too, you hop back in, right? Uh, so I don't know, I'm just throwing that out there, uh, but let's just leave it like that because I feel like that's how I want to do it. Um, and so then we would just have out here, here is the forest path area. Um, here's that side alley. Uh, and here's the garden. Yep. So that seems reasonable. So let's go ahead and, and just make that happen, right? Uh, so here we have the main room and we know there's a bunch of stuff connected to the main room. So I'm just gonna go ahead, I'm gonna just nuke this stuff uh, because uh, I need to kind of rewrite it from the diagram, which is a bit uh, different than it was before. So I'm gonna go ahead and, and uh, try to make that uh, happen. So from the main room, I'm gonna say that we can go, like that's the westward uh, direction, right? Uh, so I'm gonna say for the main room, uh, we can go to the kitchen and we can go to the tailor. And I'm just gonna say, just a priori like I was saying before, that these will just be ordinal based. So that will just say that the kitchen comes first and the tailor comes next in that order for now, right? Um, as we start to play this a little bit more, I might have stronger feelings about how that should work. Uh, but for now, I'm just gonna do it that way because I don't have a particular other way in mind that I think is somehow really awesome or, you know, whatever. Um, so then I'm gonna go ahead and say, all right, uh, we know that we've got to the south. We've got the front hall. Uh, let me do these in the in uh, uh, counterclockwise order, like a like a good boy. Um, so box index north uh, is the forest path. So now I'm seeing right like how those are are connected there, but I'm not saying exactly where they are yet. We'll get to that in a second. Um, so I want to have those. That's all the connections for the main room. Uh, there are no other connections from the main room. Uh, for the back, uh, sorry, the front hall, uh, let's do the same thing. So starting on the east, uh, we've got bedroom B and, uh, and D. I don't really care what order they go in, uh, but if we wanted to be the same as the diagram, we would have D first, then B. That's going, again, uh, counterclockwise around the ring. 
Um, and, uh, and then I need to connect myself to the main room. That's already taken care of. It's right here. Uh, and I need to connect myself to the back hall uh, and A and C. So there we go. Um, now, one thing that I suppose is a little bit tricky here is it's hard to say for a given connection, the order in which the things get added is different depending on which room you're talking about. Um, so I suppose now that I think about it, it kind of needs to be not that, right? Counterclockwise is not sufficient actually. Uh, the reason it's not sufficient is because let's suppose I'm talking about a connection between these two rooms. Uh, furthermore, let, let me do something a little bit more specific. So given what I was talking about before, the order in which these things connect uh... I guess, yeah, all right. So I'll be honest, maybe it's not true. Maybe you could always add them in the order that makes it so that it's the correct order for both rooms. but. The point that I was going to get to was just that it becomes a little bit finicky because you're like, well, the order in which I add these, maybe the order should just be strictly in ascending. And I, th I think I want to do that anyway, because it's just easier. If I just do strictly ascending or strictly descending order on a connection, that makes it easier because it doesn't matter what side you're talking about. If I'm talking about this side and I want to know the connections here, I know they just go from like smallest to greatest or whatever, right? In order um, and vice versa. Uh, no matter which side you're on, that seems like just the more sane thing. Um, so I don't know. It, it may not matter, but I think I may do it that way. Um, so I think I may say, look, let's just make it so that we say we always go from smallest to greatest. Um, so coming back here, Taylor would be first, Kitchen would be second. <clears throat> Forest path and hall are the only things on their side, so those don't matter. Right. Uh, so then coming in here, uh, we've got, it would be DB and CA. Uh, and then we need to connect to the back hall. So now that we've got that, um, connection in place, we can connect up the, uh, the bedrooms in the garden. Uh, right now we only have one, uh, let's, let's call these, let's actually just do what I said. I mean, why not? Uh, and so here I'm just going to say all of those are connected. And then, of course, also you can get out to um, the east is the garden. Uh, and then this is just a chain. These have very few. This is just like garden goes to the alley, alley goes to the path, path goes to the entrance, um, and that's it. So that creates all of the connections and says what side those connections have to be on. 
Uh, and from there, actually, we could imagine our layout routine as we get further into it, just taking it from there. Uh, what I want to do here, though, is actually just uh, be a little more prescriptive than that, which is to say that uh, I may want to just specify the sizes of the rooms. Because the thing, so once it knows all of this information, the only really thing it has to figure out is how big each room is, right? Uh, so that's the like parameter, if you will, that needs to get solved for, for lack of a better term. How big is each room? The set of, that's, that's the space of parameters. <clears throat> because whether or not a particular layout will succeed or fail is just how big is each room. And to like make that a little bit more concrete, when it went to lay these things out, if, for example, it didn't make the hallway long like that, it wouldn't be able to fit all of the room connections on it without overlapping some of these. Okay, but I want to be a little bit more specific than that. <clears throat> what I want to do here is actually sort of say how big the rooms are uh, and then have all, the only thing the layout routine actually is responsible for um, is just making sure that it places uh, the things on the connections that, are, that it's supposed to place them on, right? Uh, and that's it. So let me go ahead and prescribe some of that stuff. Uh, so I want to set the size of all of this stuff. Got everything there. Main room, save slots, the front hall, the back hall, the bedrooms, the tailor room, the kitchen, the garden, the forest path, the forest and side alley, right? Okay. So I do want to do one thing, uh, and that's nerf this. Uh, why do I want to nerf this? If I don't have the side alley, uh, then I don't have a cycle in my graph. And if I set the sizes of any, everything and don't have a cycle, uh, then I think the, ro the room should pretty much be always fairly easy for the routine to lay out. And like I said, we don't actually need to solve anything yet to have them be laid out. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, so what I would like to do is set these sizes reasonably. Um, so the main room is going to be like a larger room, uh, maybe something like a 16 by 16. Um, the uh, tailor uh, room and the kitchen, uh, maybe those are like eight by sixes, something like that. Um, I don't know if six wide is quite long enough for a kitchen and a tailor room, but I don't know. Let's say that it is for now. Um, then we've got the hallway. Uh, that's just going to be like a narrow room, uh, maybe five wide, let's say. Uh, and it will be fairly long, though. Uh, then we've got the bedrooms. Uh, those bedrooms should be, like, pretty small. Um, I guess we'll just make 8 by 6 be our standard size for now. All right, so then we want to back haul. This is going to be the opposite of the other one. This is going to be more like a 16 by 5, right? Uh, the save slots, uh, maybe your room's pretty tiny. Sorry, hero. Um, and there's three across the bottom. So this actually wouldn't quite fit uh, along the bottom. So, you know, maybe more like that. 
Again, sorry, sorry, hero, you're so tiny. Maybe we'll expand those out. Um, so the garden, uh, that should be pretty big, I think, as well. Uh, and then there's no alley at the moment. Uh, the forest path, again, should be probably a pretty big area. Uh, the forest entrance can be a, a more narrow. Uh, and then the side alley, um, just isn't involved. Um, I'm going to go ahead and pass the generator here because generally speaking, we just pass generator as the first parameter to things uh, because it's sort of the context the things operate in and we don't know if we may need it to look up parameters and stuff like that, uh, get memory or do other sorts of things. So it would be nice if those things uh, were available. Uh, all right, so now we have to actually add these informational functions that we've created uh, in so that we can specify uh, specifically more information about these rooms and so on. Uh, all right, so when we do actual connect, uh, there's this other version of the call that I wanted. Now, you might ask why I didn't just use the direction mask from A. The reason was I didn't like it being specified at the end. And the reason I didn't like it uh, being specified at the end, I guess this isn't a mask, this is just the direction. Um, I wanted to say like going from, from A to B, put the direction in the middle, right? And so this is just another way of, of talking about um, one of these. And it can just be turned into a regular connect call and we can actually uh, have this be uh, a call directly to connect that all it does is create the mask uh, from, the, from the index, right? Uh, and we have that get surface mask uh, here. We don't have one from a box index, I don't think, uh, but we should. We should add one. Uh, so get surface max mask um, from one of these. Again, very straightforward, uh, but I'm just gonna leave it that way so you can see what's happening. You don't have to wonder why I'm doing this weird shift up thing, right? And furthermore, I guess since this is only ever one direction here, I can just make this a surface index so that the compiler will type check that and make sure that someone doesn't pass more than just one direction there. Uh, and when I say more than one direction, I mean like more than the band one direction. Uh, so let me, we can just call that our connect call, uh, C-O-N-N-E-C-T, not the defunct peripheral, K-I-N-E-C-T. Uh, let's go ahead and build. <clears throat> I've got some typos. There we go. I don't know what these are here. What did we call that? Is it Taylor Room? Yes, Taylor Room. Uh, hero Bedroom is not a real thing anymore. Hero Bedroom is just gonna be like, let's say Hero Save Slot A. Uh, so now we just need this ability to set the size of a room so that we can pre-say how big we want it to actually be. Uh, and again, this is very similar to a connect call in the sense that it's it's adding sort of information to the layout that says I'm constraining where these rooms can be. Uh, this is saying I'm constraining the room to be uh, specifically this big. So there's a dim x. Uh, maybe I'll just keep using this. Too. There's a dim x uh, and a dim y. There's probably also technically a dim z, but we can just assume that it's one most of the time uh, because we don't really use height a lot. Our engine supports rooms that are fat in that way <clears throat> and maybe someday we will find use for them but you know it's really just not like we typically will expect to have rooms stacked on top of each other we will not expect to have rooms that are too tall uh, maybe there'll be a reason to have it at some point I don't know what that reason would be uh, so it's good that the engine supports it 
but I don't actually know that we care. So anyway, when we go into set the size here, what we want to do is talk about um, in the sort of world gen descriptions where we talk about what the room has and, and what its spec is. Uh, what I want to do is say, look, in, in here, we know that this is what the volume of the room is. Um, we want to set that and we can do one of two things. Either we could just say that if the volume of the room is set to something on entry, we need to use it, or we can have something in here which sort of additionally specifies that there was a volume constraint on the room. Uh, and so for example, what we could do is say, Here is a volume which says what the minimum and maximum volume is, right? Uh, and we could set that by default to the infinity uh, rectangle there, which says what well, the minimum and maximum volume can be anything you please, uh, and then we go from there. So I don't know how we want to set that at the moment. Um, I am unsure about that. So part of me likes that generality. The other part of me goes, well, really, that's not what's going on here. Like, I think most of the time, if we care this, what, what a room looks like, it's probably gonna be specific, right? So I'm guessing that we really have something that's a little bit more like, okay. or something like this. So, you know, we set a required dimension and if the required dimension is not like zero, 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 then we know that we've like said it has to be this size. Like it has to be this many rooms big. You know what I'm saying? Uh, so I'm thinking that we've got something more like, okay, this room's uh, required dim uh, I don't know why I made four of those. Um, so, I guess that would technically, I mean, Einstein taught us there were four dimensions, right? And that time is one of them. So, I mean, who are we to disagree with Einstein? He is, you know, a historical figure to be reckoned with, and I certainly don't want to have to argue with him that there aren't four dimensions because he will probably prevail in that argument, and where would that leave me? Um, anyway, the, the required dimensions, if we set those, uh, then when we go to place a room, we know that we don't really have to think about the dimensions much anymore. Uh, we can just sort of place uh, rooms with the dimensions that we encounter and so then we can sort of uh, simplify that uh, routine that we were looking at or I, I don't know that I want to actually um, get rid of it here uh, but you know um, I guess basically saying this placement code as it stands uh, is not something we're going to use right Uh, in fact, we just don't need that particular place room call. Uh, so in here, when we kind of scoot through things, so uh, I'm going to go ahead and, and do sort of a, an excision on this and say that we're just going to assume the volume is there. Uh, to 
trying to think of how I want to do this. So I think what I want to do is sort of rewrite this loop. Um, this part I don't care about anymore. We don't need it. Uh, and so what I want to do, I think, is try another one of these. Uh, so I want to do basically what I was doing before, or at least something similar. But what I want to do here is say, okay, if I don't know where this room should be yet, then I sort of place it based on, I mean, <clears throat> I want to rewrite this routine so that I always know where the room is before I start to visit it, right? Um, so when I pop a room off, I expect to already know where it is, and all I'm gonna do is place the rooms that are next to that room uh, and push them on the stack. I think that's what I want to do. You notice my hesitancy here? <laughs> um, but I think that's what I'm gonna do. So I'm just gonna try this out. Uh, so here's my, uh, how much time do I have, by the way? I've got 15 minutes left, right? Yeah, which I think is good. Uh, hold on a second here. Uh, let's see here, uh, okay. So, <clears throat> I'm gonna take a room and I want to sort of loop over the things that are in that room. Uh, the one thing I do have a little bit of concern about, I'm just trying to think of how to, to structure this. Uh, so what I think I wanna do is say, okay, the first room uh, I, I know where it's going to go. <clears throat> um, it's going to go inside its prescribed volume. Like so. And you can see here, like, I feel like this is starting to argue for actually allowing those V3s to be like added together and stuff, because you can see that we would save some time by just doing those, right? Um, so that would probably be okay. So uh, I'm gonna take the first room, I'm gonna place the room uh, and then what I wanna do is I want to loop over uh, all of the connections to the room and place them. Uh, now what I can probably do here is just say, all right, let's push this room and that'll be our loop. We grab a room, uh, we we assume its generation index has not been set. Uh, Well, that's not quite right either, is it? No, uh, that's fine. So we do set its generation index. Uh, we push it on. Assuming its generation index has not been set, we visit its neighbors uh, 
and place them. Assuming we don't, we don't. I'm not sure if that's quite right. In that case, it would just look like this. So you'd push the room on the stack. If you, if you don't match generation X, you place all of its neighbor rooms uh, who haven't been placed yet. I just don't like the way that feels. Um, it does kind of strike me as I think about it, although I want to be centric on a room and spinning it that way, it seems like it does want to be backwards the way the other one was. Um, so maybe I just leave it that way. I don't know. Maybe that is the better way to do it. Um, I'm just not quite sure. So anyway... If we assume that, then we would do it this other way where we just push the connected rooms on, like so, uh, and this stay the same. And then, so really all we're doing here is we're just gonna say uh, there's rooms, the room is placed by rote. Uh, so we look through all of our connections till we find a room that has already been placed we know where along the uh, line of rooms we should be, uh, and we put ourselves there, right? Um, the thing that's a little annoying is it just feels like this is gonna do the same placement like multiple times. Although I suppose, to be fair, what I can do is place everything along one edge at the same time. That actually doesn't seem so bad. Uh, so yeah, inside here where we say, let's loop over the connections to this thing. And you can kind of see how that goes here. In fact, it looks like this sort of thing. Um, we don't really need the push connected rooms call anymore because it's just gonna do exactly this thing. Uh, but that's, I suppose, neither here nor there. Um, in fact, yeah, I mean, you can sort of see what's going on here. If we actually did this, if we loop over these, what we would say is, let's get the connection. If uh, we haven't placed that room, make sure we put that room on the stack because we have to visit it. But more importantly, we want the other case now as well. So we're actually going to do something on both. In the case where we find a room that has been placed, uh, then what we want to do is place ourselves relative to that room, right? Uh, so here is the actual call. This would be like, you know, uh, and then when we're done, we assume that the room has uh, been placed. Now, the confusing part is if we've already placed the room, uh, we don't want to place the room again. Uh, so in a sense, what we really want to do here as well is just double check ourselves, I suppose. Um, and only make sure we place ourselves once. And that seems reasonable. So when we go to place ourselves, really all we're asking for is what's the min x, min y, min z. Uh, but because we already know what our volume is since all of the volumes have been prescribed so far. But that's not exactly what we want to do here quite yet. Uh, and the reason for that is because uh, we don't actually know. Um, how many things have to be placed along this edge, right? So we wanna do is say, all right, for this particular connection, we wanna like place the connection, right? Uh, so we wanna sort of say for, uh, for whatever this connection is or, or along edge, I guess, we wanna basically say, 
the other room is a known good room. Like we know that it goes in a particular place and we're not confused about its location or size. So we're gonna say from there, using the direction that we, the, the, the edge of that room that is what we connect to, we want to place uh, ourselves and all the other people who also share the same connection. So in order to do that, we need to uh, and I guess that could set the generation index itself, I suppose. Uh, so maybe we'll say that and maybe we'll do this. Uh, so we need to figure out what direction we use the connection in. Uh, so like what direction um, uh, we're talking about there. And uh, I don't quite remember how that worked, but I thought we had actually talked about that before. There's like an inversion uh, version of this here. Yeah, but get box mass complement, right? Um, so what I want to do here is just say, I want to know what direction I use this connection in. So I kind of want to call that's like, uh, for me, what direction does this connection go in? Um, For the time being, I kind of want to assert that it's just only got one bit set. I don't think we have is power two, do we? Uh, for the time being, I would want to make sure that no one was trying to do a fancier placement with this particular connection, because obviously we're only whole, we're only going to do ones um, in this situation where we are talking about a single direction for the time being, right? Uh, but I, yeah. I'll just ignore that for a moment. Um, so I'm gonna say direction equals get direction uh, for room. And I'm just gonna say for this connection, what direction, I guess it's, it's this room. Uh, from the other room to me, what direction is it going, right? Uh, and then we'll say, hey, uh, that's the edge we're talking about here. So I want to figure out what the bounds are of that edge, and we'll do that in a second. Uh, but that's, I think, the sketch of the routine, right? We're just gonna go through and place rooms along the edge, and then when we're done, we assume that we did place uh, that room. Uh, so in this case, this it's it's really we've already done this this call. It's this, right? Uh, and so we can sort of uh, leverage that up here. Uh, by saying, well, we're just this is what we're doing. So the direction mask for. Uh, whichever room we're coming from, it's either going to be the complement or the thing that was stored there, depending on which room we're talking about, because the connection can go either direction. So when we talk about getting the direction for the room, it's really the it's the preamble to the could go direction, which just tests it after that, right? Um, so what we want to do is is probably just reuse this code. Um, I could probably just do this and say, okay, the dirt mask is actually just get direction. Uh, for room, like so on and so forth. Uh, maybe we call that get dir mask from room. Uh, 
And I think that's mostly what we're talking about. Now, in the case where, yeah, like you can see where we don't know whether, where we have not placed the roomlets on the other side, then that's just something we want to revisit later in the routine. So this is just crawling out and placing anything it thinks it can. Place rooms along edge will be much simpler than what we did before. It'll just start at the min and lay the rooms out according to their height. If it runs out of room, it'll just be an error. Right? Uh, and that's it. So to do that, what we need to do first is say, okay, let's loop along everything that matches that dir mask. Uh, we really kind of want to assert the dir mask here. Um, so I kind of want to do a bit scan uh, to figure out what the index is. And I want that bit scan to be a, uh, a single value, right? Because we're sort of saying this is a special purpose routine that only works if you know the data looks a specific way. Because again, we're sort of crawling, we're, we're learning to crawl before we can walk here. So we're, we don't want this mask to have anything other than one direction specified. And when I say one direction specified, I mean the band one direction. So if I, uh, if I come in and replace rooms along edge, I want to sort of get a, an index uh, where I can sort of say, look, give me the box index that corresponds to this direction mask. And it's just an error if it doesn't. Right, I just want you to assert if it doesn't. That means we're outside the bounds of what we're playing with right now, uh, and off we go. Uh, so that would be something like, okay, here's the dir mask. Uh, let's bit scan it, which I believe we actually have. Uh, and so let's just use the the uh, least significant bit set. And we'll just do that. We'll assert that there was one, we'll assert that here. Uh, that it found one that's actually reasonable, right? Um, so it can't be uh, It can't be outside the bounds of the legal indices that we claim to have. And finally, it has to be equal to the original if we reconvert it, right? So the dir mask has to be uh, equal to uh, what we would get if we then tried con uh, to convert it back to a mask. Now, why am I doing that part? Uh, that's to ensure that you can't pass something with more than one bit set. So I'm going to ensure that you set a bit. I'm going to ensure that that bit was within the range of bits we allow. And then finally, I'm going to ensure that you only had one set. Because if you had more than one set, if you turn this back into a mask, it will only have one set. And this will have multiple set. And you will get an assertion failure because you won't actually match. All right. So moving back to the generation code, now that we know that we actually have an index, then what we want to do is just uh, step over the room connections uh, that we have here. So this, this same code here uh, is what we're going to, to operate with. So if I, op if I uh, opt to iterate over my rooms, 
uh, connections, what I want to do is say, all right, if the other room that we're talking about here uh, is a room that has not been placed yet, which would look like this, uh, then we're going to place that room. Uh, it's going to be uh, the sort of room everything calls, the, when you're talking about like lots of different rooms, I think it helps to name them once you get down in here. Um, so, uh, I don't know what we want to call this, like the original room or the, the base room, let's say. So I'm going to call this the base room and say that the base room is like a different thing, right? Uh, and so that maybe then we can say, all right, then there's the, the uh, other one will be the one called the room uh, by Tommy Wiseau. Uh, and that way we're just talking about the room is the one we're operating on and the base room is this other thing that we don't really care about anymore, right? So this would place all those rooms. So we have to figure out how we want that to work. Again, we're only talking about ones that share this particular directional mask, however. Uh, so I want to go ahead and make sure that uh, the directional mask uh, ends properly. So the connections dir mask, uh, um, and I guess I have to make sure that I know could where's the could go direction call. That's the I actually just want to make that call. I want to make sure we're only going to do it for for connections that actually match, right? So from the base room, uh, I want to make sure that if I pass uh, this dir mask, that I could go that direction. Right? Um, so I think that's all good. I need to actually have a version of the function that works that way. Uh, so one that doesn't have the dim side thing, one that just has the test mask. Uh, so that way I have the test mass that's being passed in and I just want to know if I could go that direction from the base room. Is, is, this, is, this actually a, is this connection actually legal to go in the direction that I'm trying to place it in? If it's not, then don't want to do it um, because it's not one of the ones getting placed in this, uh, in this edge cycle. So when I'm going to be placing the rooms along the edge here, what I want to do is say... Um, As I place each individual room, I'm going to kind of move myself down. I know what the dimensions of the room have to be, uh, but I need to be able to place them off of an edge, right? Uh, so here's the part that actually requires a little bit of finesse. Uh, what I need to be able to do is I need at this point when I actually place it, I need to be able to use some knowledge of, of how big this room has to be. So the room um, required dim, right? I need to be able to take that required dim and line up the room so that it lines up with the edge that I'm actually placing it on uh, and um, has that size. So in order to do that, uh, I think we want to go from min to max, generally speaking, uh, like I said, along the edge. So I want to do something where I'm basically saying like my min um, edge p uh, is going to be starting out getting using the dir mask. I want to be able to get what that minimum is. Uh, and so if I look at what my box uh, value stuff uh, lets me do here, I should be able to say um, using those surface params like axis and positive. I should be able to use that to decrypt, essentially, what I'm being asked to do. Um, so if I use the surface index here uh, that I got out of my dir mask, uh, then when I get the surface params, uh, I can look at the axis index 
uh, and say that whatever the room that I'm in, I can now ask what its minimum value is for that axis. So now I know uh, what the minimum and maximum values are that I could place along my edge, right? I know what those are. So as I place things, I know how to place along that edge actually quite well, right? What I need to do is take the room by Tommy Wiseau and I need to put its volume for that axis index. And, and you know, I'll just uh, grab that out into an easier to talk about thing. So I grab out which axis I'm talking about that is the edge that's the placement edge. Then as I go through each individual room, I'm going to say for this volume, uh, I want to place the minimum at wherever uh, I'm, I'm currently residing. So again, just talk about the maximal number of things here so we can see them all. Um, oops. I want to start there, right? I know that I need to place the maximum of that room at whatever the required dimension uh, would be, minus one, again, because we're always, we, we don't talk about the fill there. Uh, and then I need to advance at edge P uh, to be effectively this uh, value. Now I can shorten this a little bit just to be, if I want to be cheeky, um, by essentially doing that, because that's what we're actually doing here, uh, and then using at edge P minus one to set uh, where I want to be. Now, when I'm done with this, I want to see that at edge P is less than or equal to the max edge P, otherwise we overflowed the, the size. If we actually want to keep those rooms all placed along the edge, uh, this is what we would need to do. So I'm just going to assert that. Again, this is a very simple version of the edge uh, placement routine. Now, are we done? No. Um, the reason that we're not done is that just places the edge information, right? Uh, what we haven't done now is lined up these rooms with the other axes that we care about. And so what we need to do is based on the directional mask uh, that we're talking about here, we need to figure out how everything else would have been aligned uh, based on that particular mask. So we know a particular axis in this and we know a direction. The question is what happens to everything else? Right? What happens to everything uh, that isn't talked about in the edge axis? We have two off axes, right? Um, and so we have one case, we probably have two different ways we might want to talk about this. Um, and and uh, uh, specifically that's like, if the connection was along Z or not, like is it an up-down connection or is it not an up-down connection, right? Uh, would be one way to talk about that. And and those are, you know, different depending on, on how we want to uh, think about them, right? Uh, but this connects the, the things mostly the way that we want. And so what we're trying to figure out now is, is how we would talk about these other things, right? Uh, and what we need to do here is we need to set up the mins and maxes so that they align properly. And let's take a look at what that would entail, uh, diagrammatically speaking, right? Well, I got to go soon. I'm running out of time. Uh, hmm. uh, so what I want to do here is say, all right, in the case where I've got... Um, something happening like this. We know that this part of the layout, the part that did that and that is now taken care of. What hasn't gotten taken care of is this part, right? So what we wanna do is we wanna figure out, are we setting the max or are we setting the min of the other uh, directions that are involved? And then we can uh, sort of push those, we can, we can set those up the way that they should be uh, set up, right? Um, and to a certain extent, I think that's just going to look something like this. Uh, we need sort of a other axis um,
And you can see how this is something we could actually pull out into other code as well. So we wanna say like, look, do we align these things to the min or the max? So if we align them to the min, uh, then what we wanna do is we wanna set the maximum in this case uh, is the first thing we wanna set. And we wanna set the min to be equal to the maximum minus whatever the dimension is, right? And then there's that plus one because the dimension is always uh, slightly different, right? So you can see there, uh, we've kind of got like, all right, we're, we're placing the, the uh, room along the edge. Then we need to know what we're gonna place here. Um, uh, and in this case, we know that this is going to be whatever the base room had. Uh, I just wanna start one prior to that. So that's where this room would abut, right? Um, and then furthermore, the opposite version of this would be true. Uh, we know that if we were going to align to the max, uh, then what we would do is take whatever the max was, move one out from that, uh, and then you know do the exactly symmetric process here, right? Uh, and that's it. That again is gonna happen for the other two axes, right? The other two, uh, I'm sorry, the other ax, it's gonna happen for both axes that we care about. Uh, again, we can, can, we can consolidate this uh, a little bit in a second here, um, or probably next week, uh, but that's all we're talking about. Uh, and so what we want to know in this case is once we get the surface index, uh, we want to know, you know, what the other axes that we're setting actually are. Um, I'm not going to belabor that point too much. We're going to probably, again, pull that out into something a little bit more usable. Uh, so what I'm going to do here is just say, <clears throat> uh, we'll set these up. Uh, by just doing a pretty simple uh, switch statement here. So we know we've got the surface index and I'm just gonna decrypt it manually. And then uh, I think, like I said, this is something we can make a little bit more pro programmatic uh, in a second, but I just wanna leave this fully sketched out and then we'll come back to it um, next week. <clears throat> All right, so in the case where we're doing west and east, then axis A is one, axis B is two, right? Uh, in the case when we're doing south and north, then axis A is zero and axis B is two. Uh, and then if it's up and down, it's the other ones, right? Uh, then in terms of other A min, other B min, uh, if we're going to the west, uh, then B lines up uh, with the min and A lines up with the min. I guess, Uh, that's not actually quite true, right? Um, so B actually wants to just be equal to it uh, in this case, right? Like I think we actually just want, and since we don't have up and down connections yet, 
Uh, let me just do this. Because uh, we actually don't need to do that at all, now that I think about it. Uh, you can just have it be equal to that. Uh, so the other A is really the only one we actually need there. <clears throat> and this is not necessary. Uh, so right now we're just going to do those, and uh, we'll do it slightly differently when we get uh, when we start supporting the up and downs as well. Oops. Uh, so south it lines up with the min, yes, and north it lines up with the max. So that's fine. Uh, and I think that sets up the volume properly. I think. Uh, notice, note we are not setting up the doors right now. So we actually still would need to set up the doors. Uh, but other than that, I think we've got everything sketched in here. The doors are pretty easy to set up. They just get set up in the middle of these things. Um, so it's not particularly hard for us to do it, uh, but that's what we want to do, right? Uh, so I'm going to leave it there, I think, uh, and we'll come back because I don't have, I can't really go any later than this today. Um, so I'm going to leave it there and go to quick Q&A, but the, uh, Interesting. So from this room, it's got some kind of a non-symmetric connection. So that'll be interesting to look at. Uh, I'm gonna leave it there uh, and I will come back to it, uh, come back to it next week. I don't necessarily not wanna leave it running though. I'm tempted to just look at it really quickly. Uh, push connected rooms from the first room Orphanage for its entrance. Whoa, what? What did I do? Did I mess up something in the connect call? Okay, so that's not great, to say the least. Okay, uh, so I think that's fine. Potentially, uh, I should go and check uh, that maybe because I did something stupid, but uh, let's find out what room it's on. Uh, if that's from the Orphanage Forest entrance. Uh, so that one, the Orphanage Forest entrance should only have that's north. It should only have a north from the main room, yeah, to the forest path, forest path to the, yeah. So that should be, that one should really not have, um, so, you know, now I think about it, this assertion really isn't valid because you do have bigger rooms connected to smaller rooms. So I, it's really, we really can't assert until we have, we just need to assert that the rooms don't overlap. That's the only thing that we can really assert there. So that, that assertion is actually bogus. Um, so, yeah. Um, all right. So at least things are, are running properly now. Uh, so I, I just need to, um, 
debug everything and we'll do that next week because I, I just want to go to brief, brief Q&A uh, before I have to go. Uh, and uh, yeah, you can watch next week when we go debug it. <clears throat> Uh, Vaterfo said the edge axis is wrong, gives the direction of the connection, not the axis the connected room should align to. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm just not sure which part of the code you're talking about. Um. Which part of the code are you talking about? Oh, I see what you're saying. Yes, uh, okay, 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 I see what you're saying. These are inverted. Right, so the edge axis is actually this one. Uh, and the surface axis is actually the other one. Uh, right, because we're talking about the direction we're connecting along. Um, I suppose while we're here, I mean, I can just do uh, Right, so basically if we're traveling west, then the edge axis is actually going to be the y-axis and the alignment axis is going to be the one that we actually are using, right? I don't really need this uh, at the moment. Um, so yeah, so that's actually more like it. Uh, but I don't think that really necessarily will help us yet. I think that's not quite sufficient, yeah. Um, Cause that should have just made everything be, be mirrored. We'll get to that in a second. Can the connection be fashioned in such a way to form a long empty corridor or a stairway up and down to connect two rooms? Uh, well, connection is not, doesn't really mean that. Connection means two abutting regions. So that's actually not, you would create a room that was the shape you're talking about. You mentioned a few streams ago that the Xbox 360 controller has a crap potentiometer. Do you have an example of a controller with a good one? Uh, not really. I haven't played around with them that much uh, to look. I suspect most consumer controllers have poor potentiometers because they're trying to be inexpensive and people can't tell that well. The game developer just has to kind of like hide it all. Um, I'm only going to take on-topic questions at the moment. Have you think to use a constraint solver algorithm for room layouting? Uh, I guess I'm taking it you weren't here last weekend. That's that's what we started talking about originally, but we want to we have to get there kind of slowly, right? You can't just start with a constraint solver. Can the hero have the ability to dig the ground and fall through to the floor of the room below it? Uh, yes, if we restrict that to only diggable surfaces because we need a way to make it so that you can't dig in places because you'd fall out of the world if there was nothing below you. Um, so you could make digging, sure. Uh, but it would have to be specific to a particular ground tile type. If you want to 
you can raid a bug on that uh, as a feature request in the GitHub. All right, uh, I'm gonna wrap it up. Thank you everyone for joining me for another episode of Handmade Hero. It's been a pleasure coding with you as always. If you uh, would like to follow along with the code at home, uh, you can always pre-order the game on handmadehero.org and it comes with a source code. So as it gets developed, you can play around with it yourself. Um, that's it for this weekend. I will be back here next weekend to get all that stuff debugged and then we should have our sort of uh, ability to play around with some basic room designs and moving around and things. And then we can start to look at stuff about how we want to actually go about doing some of the more generative stuff where we don't completely specify, say, the sizes of rooms and we let it try to solve for uh, how big they would be or should be or where they should be in the case where they could be in multiple places. Uh, that's about it. Until next time, uh, thanks for joining, and uh, I'll see you all on the internet. Take it easy, everybody.